Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carolyn Colley, and I'm president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for this very important conversation about helping strengthen and create more resiliency in the Black small business community. At the foundation, we come to work every day focused on how business does well, does good, and prepares for the future. And those three things really come together when we're talking like we are today about health recovery and economic recovery, and most importantly, about creating more opportunities for more Americans, especially in communities of color. It's well known that black small businesses have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and the recession. In fact, 41% of black owned small businesses closed in the first two months of the pandemic. Think about that, nearly half of black small businesses closed. And when you multiply that by employees and their families and their communities, there's a lot of jobs and a lot of dreams that have gone away. So it's important to us because black small business owners are not only job creators, they're important anchors for our communities and they're so important for our social and cultural fabric. That's why last year we partnered with American Express, as you know, already a big champion of small business and the nation's leading black chambers of commerce to establish a new initiative. It's called the Coalition to Back Black Businesses. We've got great supporting partners, the AIG Foundation, Altice USA, Cummins, Dow, and Stanley Black & Decker. And together we are moving more than $13 million out the door to provide immediate financial assistance to black small business owners. And since September, we've already made a difference for 600 business owners in 33 states, and we're just getting started. I'm delighted to report to you today that we've just confirmed ADP as an additional supporter for the 2021 grantee cohort. This is a unique effort in several ways, and here are a few things you should know. Number one, this is not just one and done. Our funders and our supporters and everyone at the foundation, we're not just sending checks and walking away feeling good about ourselves. We're really committed to a long-term effort that goes beyond the initial grant. We're partnering with Micro Mentor and Eureka to pair each grantee with a mentor who's going to give them personal time and attention and help them with tools they need to grow their business. Number two, we're also offering $25,000 enhancement grants to the most promising grantees and will help them take their businesses to the next level. And three, we're building a resource hub on our website, webackblackbusinesses.com, for any business owner looking for additional resources. So look, we do a lot of programs here at the foundation. It's what we do best. We convene a lot of people and we run a lot of programs. And I'll tell you, there's nothing better than when we can get the whole community together live like we are today with supporters and grantors and grantees and partners. We're here to learn from each other. We'll start with a panel featuring the coalition funders who've made this effort possible. Richard Brown, the Vice President of Philanthropy at American Express, will moderate a panel where they'll talk about the roles of companies and why they're taking such significant steps and significant commitments to helping develop the Black small business community. And then our friend and colleague, Rick Wade, here at the Chamber of Commerce, he's the Senior Vice President of Strategic Alliances and Outreach. Well, Rick will moderate a conversation with our partners from the Black Chambers of Commerce, on why it's so important to support the whole community. And then best of all, we'll hear from some of our grantees about how these grants and mentorships and resources are helping make a difference for them. So thank you for joining us today. We're really proud of the coalition's first efforts and we're excited to move forward and keep growing and growing the program. Thank you. Jim with the time that the pandemic came about, having another means to kind of help out with rent, utilities and insurance and all that, cause you, those things still coming in have to be paid. And that's helped me get a tremendous boost in those areas as well as a couple pieces of equipment I would need to try to update to um, get started on my new marketing promotional item that I've done. I'm feeling really good about that, to get that up and going too. So it's been a great, help. And so I really, really appreciate 
the coalition for doing that, help me out in that area, and especially in times like this. So it's been an awesome, awesome, awesome deal. Thanks everyone for joining. Founding the coalition to back black businesses was so important to American Express given our long history of supporting small businesses highlighted by our Shopping Small and Small Business Saturday initiatives. We were confident that this was the right thing to do given the pandemic's disproportionate impact on black owned businesses. When we started this effort with the Chamber Foundation back in August, we were hopeful that other, other companies and foundations would see the same need we saw, and we are grateful that these companies have joined us in our effort. First, I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves and outline why your company is playing a significant role in helping the development of Black-owned businesses and the Black-owned business community. And first, we'll start with Scott Beyer from Cummings. Thanks, Richard. Uh, my name is Scott Beyer, and I am an Assistant General Counsel for Cummins, and I'm a leader in Cummins Care Initiative, which was launched in October of last year. Care stands for Cummins Advocating for Racial Equity, and it is an initiative where Cummins seeks to, number one, achieve police reform, two, achieve criminal justice reform, three, create economic empowerment by building Black wealth and income, and finally, drive social justice reform in the areas of healthcare, housing, workforce development, and civil rights. This CARE initiative and the changes we are seeking to accomplish are a natural offshoot of our company values, creating and advocating for more equitable and inclusive communities is a part of who we are as a company. And ultimately taking action against injustice is beneficial for our employees, our stakeholders, in our business. We decided to engage with the coalition to back black businesses because of the opportunity to work with other like-minded organizations and the opportunity to partner with the U.S. Chamber, which had already established the infrastructure to get funds and resources to black owned enterprises, allowing us to make both a significant and a quick impact. And now Myrna from Altice USA. Thank you. At Altice USA, our strength as a company is our local presence. We're integrated into the neighborhoods and the communities that we serve. And black owned small businesses represent the second largest customer base within our multicultural and minority customers. We believe in the value they bring and we believe that their success also means success for us. Our research and the research from organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation has shown that black owned businesses are being left behind. And we want to be part of the solution since supporting black owned businesses is a clear win win. The coalition to back black businesses and their approach is helping us to do this in a meaningful way. It's important to us because we are constantly thinking about how to help our communities in ways that are sustainable and long lasting. It addresses the importance of financial support, but also other necessary support that black owned businesses may need to succeed. At Altis USA, we can provide the support by leveraging what we are good at, that is connecting businesses to their clients. From a diversity and inclusion perspective, we're challenging ourselves to carefully rethink best ways to ensure our services are catering to these diverse communities that we serve. And also how we can use our resources and capabilities to help support and advance underrepresented groups. It is only by doing this that we will be able to create a more equal opportunities for everyone. And now I'll leave you with Nancy Lamb from Dow Company Foundation. Hi, thank you. And um, thanks to the Chamber, thanks to American Express for hosting this. The Dow Company Foundation got involved in this effort because unfortunately, racial bias and division is part of the social fabric of our society. And we all need to take action. It is not enough just to condemn it with words. 
we have to dismantle it in ourselves. We have to dismantle it in our organizations and in our communities. We know that Black business owners took a harder hit than others during the COVID pandemic. And our eyes were opened. And we, once we learned about this opportunity, we realized this is one way that we can use Dow's voice to get involved and help create systemic change in racial injustice. At Dow, we are committed to using our platform and our resources. This past year, we put together a framework called Dow Acts, and Acts is an acronym. It stands for Advocacy, Community, and Talent. Within each one of those key priority areas, we have a strategy and objectives, and we are already putting putting um, putting efforts and programs into action, and grants into action, and part and establishing new partnerships. The framework not only addresses racial injustice, but it creates the systemic change that is necessary for all of us to commit to, to support underserved populations, to help develop a sustainable economy after the pandemic, to build capacity in our nonprofits, in our customers, in our communities, and to enhance um, the overall economy and business owners that are struggling right now due to COVID-19. So Dow, we are committed. It's at building inclusive communities is at the top of our philanthropic priorities. And we're glad to be here today and to be able to have the resources to give back. Now I'd like to introduce Laura Gallagher with AIG Foundation. Over to you, Laura. Thank you so much. I'm Laura Gallagher from AIG. I'm the head of corporate citizenship and the president of AIG's foundation. And I'm so delighted to be here today. And I thank this group of people for having me and including me in the conversation. Um, at AIG, what unites us across our businesses and our geographies is really that we are committed to helping individuals, businesses, and communities prepare for and respond to times of uncertainty and difficulty. And in last year, we actually reestablished AIG's foundation. Um, so it was a big year for us, and I was really delighted to see that the directors of the foundation in their commitment to inclusivity and to COVID-19 relief, really focused our initial grants on those two things. And so one of the things that um, our board of directors asked us to look into was really uh, how to better support small businesses through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. Um, their feeling was really that um, small businesses are the heartbeat of many of our communities, and they wanted to know how we could better support them through grant making. And in New York City alone, where AIG is headquartered, we know that out of the 240,000 small businesses that exist in our city, um, there is a chance that roughly one third of them will not survive beyond the pandemic. And this is simply unacceptable to us. And so um, we were really pleased to find that the Chamber of Commerce Foundation's Coalition to Back Black Businesses was already underway. And frankly, we were really glad to have an opportunity to support it, to help alleviate some of the financial burdens that these small businesses are facing and to help them survive and thrive. And we also um, hope to be able to provide, in some instances, mentoring opportunities using our business expertise um, to help as well. These real societal and business-led reasons to get involved in strengthening of the black owned business community. In fact, that we were able to distribute 600 grants to businesses across 33 states in nearly every industry and have nearly 60 of them be women owned businesses is an amazing start and a great proof point of the power of this collaboration. So I'm curious to hear from all of you, why is it so important to do this work together 
and leverage the power of this partnership? And how does our partnership and our potential reach, grow, and be really an effective impact in this particular area? So, Richard, you know, when we used to go into an office pre-COVID, I have an African proverb on my wall, and it's and it says, "If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together." Um, and I think that applies here. Our potential reach does grow when we combine our efforts. An example of this is highlighted in last year's process. When American Express launched you know, this wonderful initiative, I think the investment was going to initially reach a little over 300 businesses, which is absolutely incredible. But as the coalition expanded to include other organizations like AIG, Altice, Dow, and Cummins, so did the reach of the coalition. As you just noted, 600 Black-owned enterprises across the U.S. in multiple industries were ultimately impacted, which is absolutely fantastic. So I also look forward to sharing best practices so that we can make sure that we are taking advantage of each other's learnings, um, ultimately allowing us to best accomplish our shared goal of backing Black businesses. And, you know, I would like to add to that as well, you know, a senior vice president of product development and marketing, you know, collaboration is something that is key to put products and services in uh, into the market. And I can tell you, collaboration is all that is uh, central to making a big impact. Individually, we might be able to make small changes, but collectively, our reach goes further. We can inform in more meaningful ways. We can do lasting changes. We can even shift entire systems. Partnerships can make difference between supporting and making a small effort of supporting 10 black best owned businesses in one state to go and support 600 across multiple states, as is the case for the coalition to back black businesses. And I am more than thrilled, as you mentioned before, that you know, over 59, 60% of those are women-owned businesses as well. And, and I have to say that also partnerships help realize new opportunities. Um, I'm, ju I'm just going to give you an example. You know, we found out that Black-owned businesses, they have benefited a lot from the Buy Black movement, but they are finding it so difficult to retain those customers for repeat purchases, right? So at Altice USA, you know, together with the coalition, we designed a digital toolkit to provide black owned small businesses with resources and expert advice they can use to promote their small businesses, create more engagement through social media and grow their customer base. And basically our involvement with the coalition to back black businesses is one of the catalysts behind this decision. And because of this partnership, we're rethinking how we can best support the black owned businesses and also more and other represented groups as well. Ben, because collaboration truly has the power to transform the world. And interestingly enough, Dow's brand, our, our brand line, our tagline is to seek together to seek together with customers, with communities, with nonprofits, with suppliers, because we believe the next breakthrough is actually just one idea or one inspiration away. That many perspectives, when, when they come together in partnership, that's when those ideas can become reality. Now, when you put that into the context of racial justice, it's not just up to the African-American or the black community to make this change. It's up to all of us. So Jim Fitterling, he's our CEO at Dow, and he has actually been quoted saying, it's not just, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's up to all of us, especially those of us who would likely never personally experience a situation like this. And you think about that, there's so many of us that have never been in the shoes of feeling um, discriminated against. And now it's up to us 
those of us that haven't experienced it to step up and to take action. Only together can we create a movement and it's only through massive action that we can create massive change. And I will add that there is no way that we can do this in isolation, right? There wasn't any way that AIG could have done this type of work on our own. It was really only in collaboration with the chamber and all of these other partners that we could have any level of success in helping these small businesses. Um, at AIG, we focus on collaboration and inclusivity, and those are really the keys to the success of our insurance business. Um, you know, we value um, other dimensions of diversity, and we were delighted when the chamber did let us know that uh, other dimensions of diversity have also been supported through this partnership. Um, and really by coming together as funders and working with the chamber, it's really the only way that I think that we will find long-term sustainable and impactful solutions. Thanks again to this great panel, Scott, Myrna, Nancy, and Laura, very much appreciated. And also a big thanks to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation and the four national black chambers for all they have done to stand up this remarkable coalition. I'm looking forward to working together with all of you on the next phase of the coalition to back black businesses, our mentorship opportunities, and the $25,000 that uh, enhancement program that we have. And so we're going to now hear from one of our grantees. And after that, we'll have a panel with the Black Chambers moderated by Rick Wade. Thank you very much and appreciate this opportunity. Kind of coasting along, new business, you know how that goes up and now. It's pretty much a roller coaster ride. But um, for the most part, we, we've had pretty good business up until pandemic hit. So when pandemic um, hit, we had to close the doors because of the mandated shutdown, which caused all kinds of everything to go haywire and crazy. But um, for the most part, we've been doing pretty good, pretty good since, uh, you know, we kind of opened back up. I thank you all so much for the, uh, for the grant, because with that, I was able to get back into my store. Um, yeah, you used it for paying bills. Um, you know, buying new merchandise because by the time we, we opened, I shut down in March and I didn't open back until July. And um, by the time I did, the merchandise that I had in the store was, it was time out for that season to start a new season. So I used it for merchandise purchasing, paying some of my vendors, the whole nine yards. And that has really made a tremendous difference in uh, my store, uh, my business, my advertising and my clientele. I'm Senior Vice President uh, for Strategic Alliances and Outreach at the United States Chamber of Commerce. You know, recognizing that uh, inequalities, particularly race-based inequalities, uh, still exist in America. The United States Chamber of Commerce, uh, informed by data and, and conversations across the country with business leaders of every industry, sector, and size in America, we've launched a very ambitious agenda called Equality of Opportunity Initiative. And here's what it's about. It's about advancing both private sectors and public policy solutions to address the inequalities that e exist in America and provide more equality of opportunity so that every person, uh, regardless of race, uh, can have a, a shot at living out their American dream in areas like education and criminal justice and health and wealth, et cetera. And one of the important areas is the, around entrepreneurship and business, recognizing the challenges still exist uh, as related to black businesses in America, uh, challenges around access to capital, access to corporate supply chains, and so many others. And as a part of this agenda, we're really thrilled about the work that we're doing in our coalition to back black businesses. And this conversation is about paving the way for long-term success in partnership with American Express and the U.S. Chamber Foundation and many other partners, uh, we brought together a dynamic group of individuals and organizations uh, led by uh, some of the panelists that we'll talk to in a moment who are trying to chart a new path forward. You know, here's the deal. 
uh, many black owned businesses in America just see no end in sight as a result of COVID-19, this crisis and the downturn economy with nearly half of them, half of them closing their doors already since April of 2020. Since its launch in September of 2020, this coalition has distributed grants and we're providing technical assistance and mentoring and other uh, meeting the needs and challenges that black businesses face across this country. As black businesses try to keep their dreams alive, they do need support. We need to work together, not only to strengthen these companies uh, for the purpose of creating jobs, but these businesses are very important anchors in the fabric of our society. So I'm excited about this conversation, the coalition to back black businesses, paving the way for long-term success. I'm excited to introduce our panel and so that they can join us in this very important dialogue. Join me in welcoming Charles DeBoe, uh, Vice President of the National Black Chambers Commerce, uh, Dr. Kenneth Harris, uh, President and CEO of the National Business League, and Talisha Bakavak, the Vice President of Government and External Affairs for the United States Black Chambers. Welcome all of you to this very important conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Let, let me let me just start off here. I mean, you know the data. Uh, I mean, there's data that says that some 44% of black businesses have already closed. Uh, the chamber uh, data in partnership with MetLife, we did a survey that showed that some 66% of minority businesses in general are concerned about closing. And, you know, you spent this year, uh, you know this community, you know this ecosystem, you work with black businesses every day. And let's just start the conversation. And also, I want to give you a chance to, to introduce you and your organizations. Uh, but, you know, what are you seeing with regards to the major challenges facing black businesses in America? Talisha, let's start with you. Oh, well, great. Ladies first. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Talisha Bekovac, Vice President of Government and External Affairs here at the U.S. Black Chamber. Uh, we represent 145 chambers all around the country and about 300,000 black owned businesses. And so first, let me thank the U.S. Chamber Foundation, uh, American Express, Altice, uh, and, and all the founding partners of the coalition to back black business, just for your commitment uh, to, during, to helping businesses during this challenging time. But to answer your question, Rick, uh, in 2020, black businesses uh, experienced major challenges in accessing the capital that they needed to thrive and make it through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we all know that 2 .6, there are 2.6 million uh, Black-owned businesses around the country. That was the last census report. But only about 2% of those have any employees. So we're not even talking about mom and pop businesses. We're talking about mom or pops that are primarily sole proprietors. Um, and so the issue when the, when the federal government you know, positioned and came up with the solution to help Black businesses through the CARES Act, uh, they created the Paycheck Protection Program as the primary vehicle for small businesses to access the capital. And the challenge was that, that those dollars did not flow to our community because just the very name, Paycheck Protection, uh, that doesn't help Mrs. Smith, who owns a, a, a hair salon and she doesn't have any employees because all of her stylists are 1099. Uh, it doesn't help my grandmother uh, who has a small daycare with about five employee, uh, five kids and no employees. And so that's why the coalition to back black business was so important because when we saw, um, you know, that our, our communities didn't get the funding, um, you know, the, the coalition stepped up and we've heard really great success stories from all of our members. Uh, and they're just excited first to get a, a life raft and to have this important access to capital. But then, as, Rick, as you said, Rick, they're going to have continuing mentorship opportunities. They're going to have the opportunities to network with their colleagues and do mergers and acquisitions to one another and scale to go after opportunities both now and in the future. And so we're so excited here at USBC to be a part of this uh, program because uh, what we're doing here with the coalition isn't just solving the access to capital issues now, but we're giving our businesses the mentoring and the tools uh, and the conditions to help them thrive well beyond the pandemic. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. Charles, let me let me bring you in. I mean, this is this is no you're not far into this issue because you've been leading uh, as well around these. What challenges do you see? 
And uh, Talisha talks, makes a really good point about uh, the PPP. And there's some say that we got to do a better job at uh, building relationships between lending institutions and uh, and black businesses in America. So talk about that as well as we talk about specifically access to capital and funding and financing uh, for black enterprises across America. The 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 issue is probably a lot more complex than what it may seem on the surface. Talisha hit all the, uh, the, the nail on the head of the immediacy of the shock. I mean, we, we kind of experienced beyond any imagination of a perfect storm. There was a health crisis that became an economic crisis that led to a, a, a solution that unimaginably forced all businesses to be closed as in the quarantine. And in that, there was a shock that was attempted to be addressed with the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. And as we talked about the lack of impact that that had for our constituency, for small business, uh, and particularly black small businesses, you know, I'm really glad to hear you reference the 60% because the um, study that was generally used to measure the 40% was actually done in um, April, May of uh, 2020. And since that time, it just escalated uh, of more businesses not being able to sustain and not be able to stay open. The issue of banking relationships, you know, it, it, it's the debatable because <clears throat> certain businesses got that money that came out. Uh, 90% of our constituency did not. And of the 10% that did, 90% of them got less than what they were seeking. So part of it could be relationship, but part of it is to examine who got what, why, how, what, what all went on there. The answer to that is really what's embodied in the uh, Coalition to Back Black Business that we're so uh, thankful that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, as well as the, the spirit and the lead that American Express took, actually gave a, a, a model, uh, a, a leadership on what can be done. A lot of the corporations at large really didn't know what they could do, but they wanted to do something. By forming a coalition, it took away the evaluative element of who should we support? What's the difference in this one? What's the difference in that one? When we're really in a crisis mode and those are secondary issues to who can help be helped. How can we help them? And what can we do? Part of it is certainly the low hanging fruit, the immediacy was access to capital, but then with the certain uh, uh, limited amount of funds that were made available, what can you do with that? And how can you do it? Then, what are the resources? What are the services? What can happen? A number of companies are offering services in kind, discounting products, uh, offering uh, uh, training modules, incubators, accelerators on how to apply their technology and how to use it. A business right now is forced to pivot. We're telling people that you have to do something. You can't just sit back and do nothing and expect something to happen. So with all this said, I think we're in the process of that now where we uh, have brought uh, expert mentors to make them available. And then secondly, another round of financing. Uh, and more importantly, there's a sense of community, a sense of empathy that somebody is doing something. Somebody cares about these small businesses that otherwise had no attention, were not addressed in uh, any capacity as to what was important to society or what was important to the people that were actually in control. Sure. So for that matter, I think we became a great value. Thank Good. you. Good. Thanks, Charles. You know, uh, Dr. Harris, uh, Charles mentioned the word pivot. Uh, the reality is uh, the challenges uh, that we are confronted with during this pandemic, there are a lot of emerging economies and businesses that would grow from uh, the pandemic. And I, I think our challenge is oftentimes to look uh, towards the end to the extent that we can, uh, the national business, and, and we've, we've not, this is not, this is not new stuff for black businesses. 
uh, there's a history of black business in America uh, in innovation and entrepreneurship, oftentimes out of necessity. So the National Business League is certainly not new to this game, but talk about, uh, you know, we're not new to this, but how do we look forward and learn from our history as we think about uh, beyond the pandemic? No, thank you, Rick, and, 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 and your leadership uh, that you've provided during this critical time in history. Uh, the U.S. Chamber Foundation, which I think uh, is the right organization to have built this coalition together. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Ken Harris. I serve as the 12th president and CEO of the National Business League, uh, which is the first trade association for black businesses and entrepreneurs in the country. Uh, celebrating 120 years of legacy founded by the iconic Booker T. Washington. Uh, we have local chapters all throughout all 50 states uh, and more than 120,000 members nationwide and internationally. And with that being said, to, to dig deep into the trajectory of your question, especially uh, celebrating Black History Month, uh, historically, Black businesses have always been in a crisis, uh, post-slavery, uh, during Reconstruction, we could think about Black codes being implemented, which wiped us out from the economic mainstream of society. Uh, we witnessed the pure thievery and shutdown of the first Black bank, uh, the Freedmen's and Savings Trust Company, uh, which Frederick Douglass came in and tried to save. Uh, we witnessed uh, during the Renaissance period uh, that we experienced Jim Crow and segregation. Uh, and the terroristic activity of the KKK, which uh, focused on uh, uh, areas of Black business development like Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and even during the Black Power Movement. Uh, yes, we, we have to give uh, acknowledgement to the civil rights movement, but I also say uh, the civil no economics right uh, situation, which has led us to, um, in some cases, affirmative half action uh, as it's relegated to us getting a piece of the pie instead of the whole pie. So, so black businesses will survive. Uh, not only will they survive, they will eventually thrive during COVID-19. It's in our culture. It's in our legacy. It's in our trajectory. And, and regardless of the crisis, uh, you know, thanks to the many folks who are on the front lines uh, fighting, like the U.S. Chamber Foundation and all of its financial partners, uh, being extremely intentional uh, helps Black businesses pivot, as Charles mentioned, and Talisha. So it's all hands on deck right now, and the coalition has a critical role during this period of time in history uh, to work with the public and private sector to bear out solutions in the marketplace. That's more than just a press conference and platitudes. And so this is about action, and I'm proud of the successes uh, that we achieved uh, in the first phase of this coalition but I have to take my hat off to all hands on deck and all of us working together. So again, thank you for your leadership, Rick. And uh, it's been a wonderful uh, experience working with uh, uh, Talisha and, and Charles in this endeavor. Yeah, good, good. You know, uh, uh, Kit, we certainly didn't do this all uh, alone. This is a great example of collaboration and working together. And, and certainly uh, a shout out to our major corporate partner in this coalition, American Express. Talisha, as you think about the role of, of corporation uh, in whether supply diversity, how do you envision other investments and partnerships? Because one of the things that we think about post the murder of George Floyd, all of the statements and pledges and commitments from corporate America, and you know, we got to move that conversation and those, station, those, those statements into real action. So how do you think about other opportunities in which major corporations uh, can invest in and support uh, saving and sustaining and growing black businesses in America? That's a great question, Rick. I think that there's got to be some intentionality in, in procurement and in contracting. Um, you know, last year during um, the social uprising, many of our corporate partners came uh, to the U.S. Black Chamber and said, hey, we want to help. What can we do? And we came up with some things uh, to help kind of guide both our public and our private sector partners and what they could be doing. Um, and one thing we've advocated for heavily with um, corporate partners is ensuring all of their procurement requirements have at least one diverse supplier. Um, that's easy to do. If you've got the three quote rule, uh, you can ensure that at least you that you receive at least one corporate uh, one 
quote from a diverse company. Um, and that just gets the conversation going around equitable uh, inclusion and procurement. Uh, and then looking at the public sector, you know, we're looking at the SBA and saying, hey, what can we do uh, to use the 8A program as a vehicle? Uh, the U.S. Black Chamber advocated really hard. I believe now uh, the 8A program lasts for either eight years or nine years. But we advocated uh, that 2020, if you were in the program, it shouldn't stop. Uh, that shouldn't even count 2020. Uh, and the SBA is warming up to that idea uh, to allow certain 8A contracts the federal government to have an additional year in the program. And so those are a couple of solutions. But for our corporate partners, I believe the intentionality in being engaged in the community, in the small business community, in the diverse business community, and being deliberate with your category buyers, that they're including one diverse supplier in each procurement opportunity, and that they're also creating conditions for those prime contractors to subcontract to other small businesses that might not be just ready to do business with an American Express or an AIG or an Altice just yet, but they can create the conditions to say, hey, we're gonna provide a contract to a diverse supplier. And then within that agreement, we wanna ensure that there are diverse subcontracting um, criteria in that. We think that's a really good bottom-up strategy uh, to build economic development and we've seen it be successful. You know, the federal government has um, procurement goals. Many of our corporate partners have procurement goals, uh, but we think that this should be the standard um, in supplier diversity that, it, you know, there should be more inclusion in that because what businesses need now is an opportunity to do business. Um, and we think that that's a way to organically uh, spur the economy and ensure that all black businesses and all small businesses are part of the recovery. Yeah, yeah, Talisha, that's a really good point. Charles, um, coming back to you, you know, she makes a, Talisha makes a good point that this is about uh, advancing our economy because we, we, we know that it's the moral uh, and right thing to do to advance equality, but there's a case for uh, advancing our economic growth. Uh, what's your thoughts? How do we continue to make sure that when we think of business and American economy, that we're including black business in that ecosystem and thinking about it from a business imperative and not just a moral and philanthropic one. We have a, a, a rare opportunity that there may have never been as an openness and attitude to do business with somebody that maybe you didn't normally or hadn't previously done uh, and, and to look beyond your community. So for example, in, um, as it relates to the, to food, for example, they had talked about wastelands and the lack of availability of grocery stores. And now there are businesses that are in the delivery aspects that are doing more to, in, to be inclusive, including in recognizing and placing value on those consumers. So um, in general, we wanna lift all boats. So when we go back to talk about uh, diversity, and, and certainly one of the buzzwords of the moment is diversity and inclusion. And typically diversi diversity and inclusion had been procurement, supplier and buyer relationships. We wanna expand that conversation, that concept to include the C-suite, talking about the executives, talking about internships, the human resource department, talking about every aspect of that business being inclusive and how you may not have known somebody or been able to interact or talk with somebody, but we're here to facilitate, to put some bridges in places to allow those things to actually cross the bridge or at least extend your hand and pull somebody up. It isn't limited to in any capacity. There is a huge wave of new businesses that are coming forth. Some of them may be in the technology space, but one thing for sure, almost all of them will have some dependency on electronic commerce of transactions that are occurring via the uh, internet or in some uh, electronic aspect. So there's a lot of need. Part of the solution is going to be accessibility to market, meaning that you can find a customer for your product. Part of our job is to help expose those products. So it, there, there's no limit of to all the things that need to be included. And certainly it is so vast that even with our broad coalition here, we still can use all the help 
And really, it's each person getting engaged, each citizen, each business, each consumer to consider trying something a little bit different or going outside your norm to be including uh, or considerate of other opportunities, other products, other services. You bet. Charles, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we think about diversity, equity, inclusion. It's, it's got to be horizontal and vertical. In fact, even corporate boards. You know, we just announced at the chamber in partnership with the National Association of Corporate Directors, a national diversity board accelerator, where we're committing to placing 250 black executives, identifying, preparing, and connecting them to corporate boards. And I've been an advocate for years that black business owners should be in that line. So uh, that is another opportunity it's where black business owners who know a PL, who know what a payroll means, that they can add value to corporate boards. Dr. Harris, uh, you know, as we kind of start winding down this conversation, you know, you, all of us have talked a lot about the importance of this coalition and the idea and the value proposition of, of finding common ground to work together. Uh, talk about how that has manifested itself uh, in this really unique uh, coalition to back black businesses, the importance of working together in a common ground and having a collective voice. Yeah, no question about it. One, uh, you know, this is the day and age of collaboration and coalitions. Uh, you can no longer uh, seek things from an individual standpoint anymore. If you can uh, align on, on interests uh, that bear certain results, it's the perfect partnership, especially strategically. And so all hands on deck is what I say. And so this coalition sets a precedent, uh, especially when you talk about uh, racial equity and inclusion or diversity, because what we've been challenging um, corporate America to realize as well, and speaking from a unified collaborative voice is, is that diversity can't be a diversion or diversity cannot be uh, diluted uh, where you have white women and white LGBTQ or white veterans uh, benefiting from the minority status. And so when we can speak as a collective voice, um, we come with strength. And I think people are more willing to, to, to uh, not only listen to us, uh, but to take us seriously. Uh, and it's accountability that sometimes comes behind it, but that's what we're all searching for. And then last but not least, just on a good note, you know, before the pandemic, black business was growing three times the national rate. Uh, so even though we're experiencing this pandemic right now, this crisis situation and economic shutdown, you know, I envision that a more sophisticated black entrepreneur will emerge from this post pandemic. Why? Uh, because black business ownership uh, will have realized that the pandemic not only exposed us to the opportunities that enterprise and entrepreneurship can offer, but it's a, a key way towards economic freedom, generational wealth, opportunities to expand internationally through import, export, and trade, uh, and more importantly, to transition into the technology and knowledge-based economy. And I always say, the revolution won't be televised, it will be digitized. So programs like the Coalition to Back Black Business is right on time. And thanks for the U.S. Chamber Foundation leadership to all of our partners uh, who are working together to make sure that black businesses reach the reality of prosperity uh, that is on their front doorstep, especially in 2021. Hey, thank you, Doug. You always got that great uh, closing uh, statement that to bring it all together. Again. <laughs> Let me know. I, this is a very quick one answer. If you can do that, uh, hardest question I will ever ask. You know, I always got to throw one in there. Talisha, give me a book, a movie. What are you doing just to have fun as we think about making it through this pandemic or something that you look forward to on the other side as we get beyond this pandemic? Oh, that's a great question. I'm just I'm just looking forward to getting back together again. You know, I remember back when we had the opportunity to go to conferences and the network and, uh, you know, meet with our colleagues on the Hill. You know, I'm really looking uh, looking forward to getting back to that because, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is relationships, you know, and that's the value of this coalition. Uh, you know, you build relationships, you come together and that speaks volumes, you know, both uh, with 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 corporate leaders, with lawmakers, you know, having the relationships to be able to come together and build a coalition is so critical. But I'm I'm old. I'm an old school Southern girl, and, and I I miss getting back in person. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, again, before 
uh, you let me go. I just want to thank you again, Rick, and to the U.S. Chamber, to American Express, to Altice, and to the whole coalition. Uh, just thanks for allowing the U.S. Black Chamber to be a part. And we look forward uh, to doing great things both now and in the future. Well, we're excited to have you. Charles, very quickly, and then Dr. Harris, very quickly. We're really excited about the optimism, we're, the glow of optimism of what, what this is going to come about. Uh, Dr. Harris just mentioned about what the, the learning curve how strong we're going to be when we, if you can survive this, you know, uh, God only puts you through challenges that make you stronger. Then we're, we're strong beliefs of that. So again, we also are very humbled and excited and learned a lot by being a part of the coalition. We certainly thank the uh, corporate leaders and America Express, the founders, uh, all, everyone with it. And we're excited and we're looking forward to going further. Thank you. And Rick, I and as we mentioned, you speak about coalitions. A book that I'm reading right now is, is The Defeat of Black Power, Civil Rights in the National Black Convention of 1972, uh, written by my good friend Leonard Moore. Uh, and it's all about coalition. It seems like history repeats itself. Uh, so that is a wonderful uh, Amazon uh, purchase that everyone can make. Well, listen, thank all of you for joining us in this very important conversation, the coalition to back black businesses paving the way for long-term success. And I will say paving the way for prosperity so that everybody can have a fair shot at equality of opportunity and realizing their own American dream. Thank you all. Look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending our session today. So proud of the work the coalition has done. Look forward to the enhancement grant process and entrepreneurs working with their mentors to grow their businesses. Thank you to our founding partner, American Express, and our other partners, Altice, Dow, the AIG Foundation, Cummins, Stanley Black and Decker, and our newest partner, ADP. We want to encourage our grantees to continue to engage with their mentors on the MicroMentor and Eureka platforms. And also, if you're interested in becoming a corporate partner, please let us know. Thank you and take care. <laughs>